You guys help me make sense of it. I want to show that this is equal to, and this is my question, why is this equal to, right? Why is this equal to e to the x cosine y plus i e to the x sine y when z is equal to x plus i y, right? Because this was our initial definition, right? That was our initial definition. So now, if I've introduced this as the definition, I'm begging a question. Is it the same, is it the same thing? Right? So what, I, I, I honestly haven't thought about this before class. I'm asking you guys now, what, what do you think the right way to think about this is? The right way is the lazy way. How about this? We should have a restriction theorem. If the complex x, if this formula holds for, um, if, this formula, if this formula holds for all z, then you see what I can do here. If I put z equals to x, right, then I get e to the x is equal to the sum. I don't know if this helps or not. This is just kind of like, oh, well, great. <laughs> That is, in fact, the regular exponential. I mean, I'm assuming we will need to know that these formulas define the real sine, cosine, cinch, cosh, right? The regular real, real formulas are also defined by these power series for real variables, right? So we, we need to have that in mind for this calculation. So that's one thing. Hmm. I kind of want to take, I, I kind of want to look at the real part of both sides, but I'm kind of afraid to do it, you know? Maybe, maybe we should use polar coordinates. You're like, maybe you should take this problem off the quiz. <laughs> right? Thought has occurred to me. Let's try polar coordinates. What happens with polar coordinates? If I look at you know, <coughs> the modulus of e to the z, right? <laughs> well, I need a theorem. Let's, let's suppose that this theorem is true, okay? <laughs> oh, man, do I know that? Oh, that seems, that seems ill-fated. I can't just say that the modulus of a series is the series of the moduli. That's garbage. Can't do that. Have you have no faith? I have you just faith. see this. You just see this going nowhere. Oh, you got you got place to be. It's okay. I, I'm, I apologize in advance if, if I, uh, 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 like that in the mic because we don't know. Yeah, <clears throat> I did get. What do you say? Is what it is. I had that happen in calculus three this morning because I had bad bad battery. Any ideas? Yeah. Divide out e to the x. Ooh, I like that. That's actually really good. So, how about this? Yeah, e to the e to the minus x. E to the minus e to the x. Um, e to the i y, right? Because this is so we minus x plus x plus i y, right? So that's just equal to, now here I am using the theorem that's proved in the book, the adding angles formula, um, the, ad, the, the law of exponents, yeah? So that's e to the i, y. Aha! Nice. Real nice. Let's see, that's some, uh, some n equals zero to infinity of what you got here. Well, you got yourself an i, y to the power n over n factorial. And so you break that up into the sum j equals zero to infinity of i y to the 2j divided by 2j factorial plus the sum j equals 0 to infinity of i y to the 2j plus 1 over 2j plus 1 factorial. I can do that because I'm doing nothing more than parsing this into the even and odd terms. But this was a very good move to make because i to the 2j is in fact equal to i squared to the j, which is in fact minus 1 to the j, 
And so this simplifies straight up to the sum j equals 0 to infinity of minus 1 to the j divided by 2j factorial y to the 2j plus the sum, I regret my choice of j, j equals 0 to infinity, um, there's an i out here, minus 1 to the j divided by 2j plus 1 factorial y to the 2j plus 1. Lo and behold, cosine of y plus i sine of y, and then from this identity, we get that identity. Perfect. Thank you. Nice. Real nice. Cool. So it seems to me the magic step is going to be making everything exponential so we can use Jeff's trick. So like we can convert <coughs> you can you can get from like cosh z is one half e to the z plus e to the minus c. Okay, I have hope. Now, I'm assigning this problem. Just try. If if you get stuck on it, it's like not the end of the world. It's just it's an experiment. All right. So. <coughs> I think the problem, I mean, the, the problem is interesting. It's an obviously interesting question. Why are these definitions equivalent to the ones I've already given? Right? It is something that you should try to understand. It's kind of like central story arc in this course. Let's talk about the branch cut issue, yeah? Let's talk about that. <coughs> now, first of all, my apologies. I'm not telling you this like a week ago because maybe that would have reduced some of the suffering. Now, there maybe has been enough suffering that you might appreciate what I'm about to do, all right? Um, so, as I grade the one thing you just turned in, or my grader grades, hopefully, she's ever so pleasant, and um, I will try not to like bleed you a lot of points for that, because I think, I mean, I've been trying to find the right way to talk about it, but I think maybe today I finally had a breakthrough that I think maybe you'll understand. So <clears throat> suppose, where are we, example five? Five-ish. Yeah. I think that was a four. I just didn't number it. Here, I'll, I'll make it official. Oh, really? Oh, I give up then, all right. Well, you can add an I. <laughs> There we go. Um, so, how about this? Yeah? Oh. Um, I have f of z equals to um, like the log of <coughs> z cubed uh, minus i. Now let me write, let me say this a little bit different. I have the log of this sub alpha equal to this. And the, then the question is this. Um, can we choose, can we choose alpha such that the resulting function, which of course is called a branch cut. It's a branch cut because it's a, sl a selection of the infinity of, of the multiply valued little log, all right? This is the real, real result, <laughs> words, resulting function is holomorphic on, you know, the real part of z, let's say, be greater, greater than zero. In other words, is it possible to choose a branch that would make this function holomorphic on the upper half plane? <clears throat> so here's the thing that's tricky. And it's just a simple calculational procedure, but what we need to do is we need to look at, <coughs> we need to look at where is the input to the logarithm troublesome? And so the log sub alpha, where is this not defined? Right? Is it third minus i less than zero? No. Uh, we have to think about this. The angle, the, it's the, this, this, this right here, right? C alpha, the, the, the complex plane with the alpha ray removed. What is this? These points 
have the form T e to the i alpha, right? T e to the i alpha for T non-negative. That's a parameterization of the ray of badness. What are you trying to avoid? In other words, different words. Where is the badness for your function? It's where T e to the i alpha is equal to z cubed minus i. See, so if you can't look at it, you have to do out, you gotta, there's a problem here. You gotta solve for z to understand where the badness goes in general. Now some of the problems were simple enough that it was just a shift, like one minus i or something, you can just kind of move the ray. But when it's a square or a cube or something more hideous, you have to analyze where the badness goes. And so to do that, it's simple, I solve for z. See, this is z cubed is equal to t e to the i alpha um, plus i. Now I may have made a problem that's too complicated for me to solve in the last two minutes of class, but you see what we have to do. See this means that z is, you know, an element of the third roots of t to the i alpha plus i. See, we know how to solve that equation. We know that there is, in fact, three places of badness when we have a cube in there. If you put a square, there are two badnesses. With a linear, just one badnesses. And um, so just to make it explicit, let us suppose alpha is equal to, oh, I don't know, pi. Just for the sake of calculation, let's see what happens with that one, all right? So then z would be an element of, what's e to the i pi? What's that? Negative one, so we've got minus t plus i to the one third. <coughs> I regret my choices. I'm gonna trade that for a pi over two. Make my life easier here. e to the i t minus i t. All right, at this point I can do this calculation pretty quickly because that is i times what? One minus t, right? So what's the, what's the uh, what is this equal to? It's equal to like the mo uh, absolute value of one minus t times what? E to the i pi over two. So this gives us what? Principal third root is the cube root of one minus t, e to the i pi over six, right? And then you've got this times what? Times e to the two pi i over three, or that, well, that to the k for k equals to zero, one or two. Those are your, <coughs> those are your third roots. Where are those geometrically? <coughs> mm. Son of a gun. Then you have to plug it. Think about it. Think about it. What is, what does this look like? Where is that? Where does it start? So I think this one is like, um, if I put t equals to zero, where am I? I'm like one unit out, like here on the pi over six, right? And as, what happens as, as t goes, um, ooh, oof. I probably should write it the other way, right? There's an absolute value in here anyway, right? Because we, we allow t to go on and on. So that, that's giving you this. Where's the other, where's the, where's the other bad one? Then, then this next solution is rotated. They don't all look like this. The one I worked out with one of you earlier, it wasn't like this at all. It had a different shape altogether, but it had two things. The one we worked with a square root. I guess it's down here if I have my picture is right, but I'm, I'm not 100% sure. So <coughs> that's what happens with, <coughs> with alpha equal to pi over two. And I think that the answer to my question is no. We cannot choose an alpha because basically by symmetry what's gonna happen is as you choose a different alpha, the, the places where you have badness in the, in the branch they're just gonna like rotate around and there's always gonna be one of them messing up your holomorphicity in the upper half plane. This is the calculation you're up against. You need to set the input to the log equal to the place where it's bad and then work out what that means for z. 
this either requires like solving a quadratic equation or like it's something you can do if the problem's reasonable. We could do more hideous things like throw a sign in there and see what happens. Let's not do that. <coughs> Does that make more sense? I mean, you're like, yay, now that my homework's done. But 